Uh, looks like stream should be on. Give me a quick minute to make sure that it is. All right, streams live. Streams live. Looks like stream is live. Let's just get right into it. Chapter 10, normal subgroups and factor groups. If H is a subgroup of a group G, then right cosets are not always the same as left cosets. That is, it is not always the case that GH is equal to HG for all G and G. The subgroups for which this, is, uh, this property holds play a crucial, group, uh, crucial role in group theory. They allow for the construction of a new class of groups called factor or quotient groups. Factor groups may be studied directly or by using homomorphisms, a generalization of isomorphisms. We will study homomorphisms in chapter 11. 10.1. Factor groups and normal subgroups. Normal subgroups. A subgroup H of a group G is normal in G if GH equals HG for all G and G. So H as a subgroup, we'll use this notation for subgroup of G is normal if GH is equal to HG. So that is a normal subgroup of a group H uh, of a group G is one in which the right and left cosets are precisely the same. Example 10.1. Let G be an abelian group. Every subgroup H of G is a normal subgroup, since GH equals HG for all G and G and H and H. It will always be the case that GH is equal to HG. Example 10.2. Let H be a subgroup of S3 consisting of the elements 1 and 1, 2. Since 1, 2, 3, H equals 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, and H123 equals 12323, H cannot be a normal subgroup of S3. Notice here that we have 13 and 23 differing between the two um, between the two cosets. However, the subgroup N consisting of the permutations 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, oh no, wait, oh, my apologies, consisting, uh, consisting of the permutations 1, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2 is normal. Since the cosets of n are n equals 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, and 1, 2, n equals n, 1, 2, equals 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3. The following theorem is fundamental to our understanding of normal subgroups. Theorem 10.3. Let g be a group and n be a subgroup of g. Then the following statements are equivalent. 1. The subgroup n is normal in g. 2. For all g and g, G n g to the negative one is a subgroup of, or is a subset of n. Three, for all g and g, g n g to the uh, negative one is equal to n. Proof: one implies two. So first, we're going to be proving that the subgroup n is normal in g implies that for all g and g, g n g to the negative one is a subset of n. Since n is normal in g, g n equals n g for all g and g. Hence, for a given g and g and n and n, there exists an n prime in n such that g n equals n prime g. Therefore, g n g to the negative one equals n prime in n, or g n g uh, to the negative one is a subset of n. Two implies three. So we're gonna be showing that g n g to the negative one is a subset of n implies that g n g to the negative one equals n. Um, let g and g. Since g n g to the negative 1 is a subset of n, we need only show that n is a subset of g n g to the negative 1. For n and n, g n to the negative 1 n g equals g to the negative 1 n g to the negative 1 to the negative 1 is an n. Hence, g to the negative 1 n g is equal to n prime for some n prime in n. Therefore, n equals g n prime g to the negative 1 is in g n g to the negative one. Three implies one. So we're going to be showing that if these are equal, then the subgroup H is uh, subgroup n is normal. Suppose that g n g to the negative one equals n for all g and g. Then for any n, there exists an n prime such that g n g to the negative one equals n prime. Consequently, g n equals n prime g, or g n is a sub uh, a subset of ng. Similarly, uh, similarly uh, ng is a subset of gn. 
factor groups. If n is a normal subgroup of a group G, then the cosets of n in G form a group G over n under the operation an bn equals abn. So I will quick write this down. So G over n is defined to be an times bn equals a b n. This group is called the factor or quotient group of g and n. Our first task is to prove that g over n is indeed a group. Theorem 10.4. Let n be a subgroup of a group g. The cosets of n and g form a group g over n of order g uh, in the index of n and g. Proof. The group operation on g over n is an times bn equals abn. Um, think in this case of the, I, uh, the ab having parentheses between them. This operation must be shown to be well defined. That is, group multiplication must be independent of the choice of coset representative. Let an is equal to bn and cn is equal to dn. We must show that an cn equals acn equals bdn equals bn dn. Then, a equals bn1 and c equals dn2 for some n1 and n2 and n. Hence, acn is equal to bn1 dn2 of n is equal to bn1 d of n is equal to, this is where we use the fact that the group is normal to swap these around, bn1 uh, n d, then bn of d, and then we once again use the normality of the subgroup to swap d and n around to finally get bdn. The remainder of the theorem is easy. En equals n is the identity, and g to the negative 1n is the inverse of gn. The order of gn is, of course, the number of cosets of n and g, which is what we define the index to be. It is very important to remember that the elements in a factor group are the sets of elements in the original group, and not elements in the original group as of themselves. Example 10.5. Consider the normal subgroup of S3, n equals 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2. The cosets of n in S3 and n, uh, the cosets of n S, uh, of S, wait, my apologies. The cosets of n and S3 are both n and 1, 2, n. The factor group S3 over n has the following multiplication table. We have n multiplied by n equals n, 1, 2, n multiplied by n, 1, 2, n, and 1, 2, n multiplied by 1, 2, n is equal to n. This group is isomorphic to z sub 2. At first, multiplying cosets may seem both complicated and strange. However, notice that s3 sum over n is a smaller group. The factor group displays a certain amount of information about s3. Actually, n is equal to a3, the group of even permutations, and 1, 2, n equals 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3 is a set of odd permutations. The information captured by g over n is parity. That is, multiplying two even or two odd permutations results in an even permutation, whereas multiplying an odd permutation by an even permutation yields an odd permutation. Example 10.6. Consider the normal subgroup 3z of z. The cosets of z are 0 plus 3z equals 0, 3, negative 3, on and on, 1 plus 3z equals 1, negative 2, 4, on and on, and 2 plus 3z equals 2, 5, negative 1, 8, on and on. The group 3 over 3z is given by the Cayley table below. So, for example, I'm just going to be talking about the representatives. 0 plus 0 is equal to 0, 1 plus 0 is equal to 1, 1 plus 2 is equal to 2. Um, we have 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, 1 plus 2 is equal to 0, 2 plus 1 is equal to 0, 2 plus 2 equals 1. In general, the subgroup nz of z is normal. The cosets of z over nz are nz, 1 plus nz, 2 plus nz, all the way to n minus 1 plus nz. The sum of the cosets k plus nz and l plus nz is k plus l plus nz. Notice that we have written our cosets additively, because the group operation is integer addition. And this, if the book doesn't elaborate on it yet, 
I think um, if you've seen all the previous chapters, you already know what this example is leading up to. But continuing, continuing. Example 10.7. Consider the dihedral group D sub n, generated by two elements R and S, satisfying the relations R to the n equals ID, S squared equals ID, and SRS equals R to the negative 1. The element R actually generates the cyclic group of rotations Rn of dn. Since SRS to the negative 1 equals SRS equals R to the negative 1 is an Rn, the group of rotations is a normal subgroup of d sub n. Therefore, d, um, d sub n over r sub n is a group. Since there are exactly two elements in this group, it must be isomorphic to z sub 2. 10.2 The simplicity of the alternating groups. Of special interest are groups with no non-trivial normal subgroups. Such groups are called simple groups. I'll just quick write that as a group. As a definition. A simple group. A simple group is a group with no non-trivial normal subgroups. The normality condition is extremely important in this. So basically you can think of a simple group as being, one way to think of that is being a kind of prime number in a sense. Because if a simple group had a normal subgroup, we can take a factor group of it, we can quotient out some information. But if we can't, it acts similar to a prime number. We can't divide it and get another group, like how you can't divide a prime by any like non-trivial number to get another integer. So, of course, we have already seen a whole class of simple groups, z sub p, where p is prime. These groups are actually trivially simple, since they have no proper subgroups other than the subgroup consisting solely of the identity. Other examples of simple groups are not so easily found. We can, however, show that the alternating group a sub n is simple for n greater than or equal to 5. The proof of this result requires several lemmas. So wait, before I begin the lemmas, I'm just going to say, this is going to seem like we're doing a lot of work for nothing. And currently, yes, we're doing a lot of work for nothing. However, the fact that a n is simple for n greater than or equal to 5 is extremely closely related to the fact that polynomials of degree 5 or higher do not have a closed form general solution for finding roots. So before we begin on a whole bunch of technical information, know that this theorem is actually extremely vital for what we're kind of building up to in the ending, even if we haven't yet seen what that ending is going, uh, going to be. In short, this is going to have deep relations to Galois theory. So let's begin. Lemma 10.8. The alternating group AN is generated by three cycles for n greater than or equal to 3. Proof. To show that the three cycles generate a n, we need only show that any pair of transpositions can be written as the product of three cycles. Since a b equals b a, every pair of transpositions must be one of the following. Either a b a b equals id, a b c d is equal to a b c a c d, or a b a c is equal to a c b. So we can write every pair of transpositions as a triple, where in this case we're considering this as a triple, which is just sending everything to itself. Or this could be a like a three cycle multiplied by itself three times. So we can think of it as being like a b a b is a b c a b c a b c. So lemma, um, yeah, that actually completely characterizes that. Uh, lemma ten point nine. Let n be a normal subgroup of a sub n, where n is greater than, is greater than or equal to 3. If n contains a 3 cycle, then n equals a sub n. Proof. We will first show that a sub n is generated by 3 cycles of the specific form i, j, and k, where i and j are fixed in 1, 2, n, and we let k vary. Every 3 cycle is the product of 3 cycles of this form, since i a j is equal to i j a squared, IAB is equal to IJB IJA squared, JAB is equal to IJB squared equals IJA, 
and ABC equals IJA squared, IJC, IJB squared, IJA. Now, suppose that N is a non-trivial normal subgroup of A sub N for N greater than or equal to 3, such that N contains a 3 cycle of the form IJA. Using the normality of N, we see that IJ, AK, IJA squared times IJ, AK to the negative 1 is equal to IJK, is an N. Hence, N, um, hence N must contain all the three cycles IJK for 1 less than or equal to K less than or equal to N. By lemma 10.8, these three cycles generate A sub N. Hence, N equals A sub N. Alright, let me also get, um, take a quick second to double check this using the normality then. We see that this multiplied by this complicated term. Alright, so basically, we multiply on the right side by our thing. And by normality, we also have something multiplied by the left side by that thing. We'll get us something in that thing. Basically, the insurance that if we have an element in HG, then we have a corresponding element in GH. Lemma 10.10. .10. For n greater than or equal to 5, every non-trivial normal subgroup n of a n contains a 3 cycle. Proof. Let sigma be an arbitrary element in a normal subgroup n. There are several possible st uh, cycle structures for sigma. First, sigma is a 3 cycle. Second, sigma is the product of disjoint cycles. Sigma equals tau a1, a2, all the way to ar is an n where r is greater than 3. 3. Sigma is the product of disjoint cycles, as in sigma equals tau, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6. Five, uh, 4. Sigma equals tau, a1, a2, a3, where tau is the product of disjoint 2 cycles. 5. Sigma equals tau, a1, a2, a3, a4, where tau is the product of an even number of disjoint 2 cycles. If sigma is a 3 cycle, then we are already done. If n contains a product of disjoint cycle sigma, and at least one of these cycles has a length greater than, um, let's say, 3, say sigma equals tau a1, a2 up to ar, then a1, a2, a3, sigma a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1, is an n since n is normal. Hence, sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, sigma a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1, is also an n. Since sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, sigma, a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1, is equal to sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, sigma, a1, a3, a2, is equal to a1, a2, all the way to ar to the negative 1, tau to the negative 1, times a1, a2, a3, times tau, times a1, a2, all the way to ar, times a1, a3, a2, is equal to a1, ar, ar to the minus 1, all the way up to a2, so reversing that order, times a1, a2, a3, times a1, a2, all the way up to ar, is e, uh, times a1, a3, a2. All that quotients out to get us something a1, a3, ar. So, n must contain a 3 cycle. Hence, n is equal to a sub n. Now, suppose that n contains a... Uh, blech, Contains, uh, now suppose that n contains the disjoint product of the form sigma equals tau a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6. Then, sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a4, sigma, a1, a2, a4 to the negative 1 is an n. Since a1, a2, a4, sigma, a1, a2, a4 to the, uh, to the negative 1 is an n. So, sigma to the negative 1 a1, a2, a4, sigma, a1, a2, a4, to the negative 1, equals tau, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6, to the negative 1, times a1, a2, a4, times a tau, times a1, a2, a3, times a4, a5, um, a6, times a1, a2, a4, to the negative 1, is equal to a4, a6, a5, times a1, a3, a2, times tau to the negative 1 times a1, a2, a4, times tau, a1, a2, a3, times a4, a5, a6, times a1, a4, a2, is equal to a1, a6, a5, 
times a1, a3, a2, times a1, a2, a4, times a1, a2, a3, times a4, times uh, a5, a6, times a1, a4, a2, which all simplifies out in the algebraic dust to be a1, a4, a2, a6, a3. So n contains a disjoint cycle of length greater than or equal to 3, and we can apply the previous case to show that it must contain a 3 cycle. Suppose n contains the disjoint product of the form sigma equals tau a1, a2, a3, where tau is the product of disjoint 2 cycles. Since sigma is an n, sigma squared is an n, and sigma squared equals tau a1, a2, a3, tau a1, a2, a3 is equal to a1, a3, a2, so n must contain a 3 cycle. The only remaining possible case is a disjoint product of the form sigma equals tau a1, a2, a3, a4, where tau is the uh, product of an even number of disjoint 2 cycles. But sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, sigma, a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1 is an n, since a1, a2, a3, sigma, a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1 is an n. And so sigma to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, sigma, a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1 is equal to tau to the negative 1, a1, a2, a3, a4, a1, a2, a3, tau, a1, a2, a3, a4, a1, a2, a3 to the negative 1 is equal to a1, a3, a2, a4. Since n is greater than or equal to 5, we can find a b in 1, 2, up to n, such that b is not equal to a1, a2, a3, a4. Let mu is b equal to a1, a3, b. Notice here, I'm just going to double check, like really point out the importance of this since n is greater than or equal to 5. Let mu is equal to a1, a3, b. Then, mu to the negative 1, a1, a3, a2, a4. Mu, a1, a3, a2, a4 is an n. And, mu to the negative 1, a1, a3, a2, a4. Mu, a1, a3, a2, a4 is equal to a1, b, a3, a1, a3, a2, a4, a1, a3, b, a1, 3, a2, a4, is equal to a1, a3, b. Therefore, n contains a 3 cycle. This completes the proof of the lemma. <sighs> Alright. That was a lot. So just taking stock of what we just went through. We saw that there are either five different cases for what, like, a cycle structure must be. Then, we can reduce all these to three cycles, functionally. It takes a lot of work, but we can ultimately reduce them to containing three cycles. And then, by this previous lemma, if it contains a three cycle, then we know that n is going to be equal to the whole group. So that if it's a normal group, a normal subgroup, it's going to be a trivial normal subgroup. Alright. Theorem 10.11. The alternating group, a sub n, is simple for n greater than or equal to 5. Proof. Let n be a normal subgroup of an. By lemma 10.10, n contains a 3 cycle. By lemma 10.9, n equals a sub n. Therefore, a n contains no proper non no proper non-trivial normal subgroups for n greater than or equal to five. Historical note: one of the foremost problems of group theory has been to classify all simple finite groups. This problem is over a century old and has been solved only in the last few decades in the 20th century. In a sense, finite simple groups are the building blocks of all finite groups. The first non-abelian simple groups to be discovered were the alternating groups. Galois was the first to prove that A5 was simple. Later, mathematicians such as C. Jordan and L. E. Dixon found several infinite families of matrix groups that were simple. Other families of simple groups were discovered in the 1950s. At the turn of the century, William, Bursa, William Burnside conjectured that all non-abelian simple groups must have even order. In 1963, W. Freight and J. Thompson proved Burnside's conjecture and published their results in the paper Solvability of Groups of Odd Order, which appeared in the Pacific Journal of Mathematics. Their proof, running over 250 pages, gave impetus to a program in the 1960s and 1970s to classify all finite simple groups. Daniel Gorenstein was the organizer of this remarkable effort. 
One of the last simple groups was the monster, discovered by Argrice. The monster, a 196, a 133 times 196, 833 matrix group, is one of the 26 sporadic, or special, simple groups. These sporadic simple groups are groups that fit into no infinite family of simple groups. Some of the sporadic groups do actually play an important role in physics. <sighs> Alright, so... Alright, reading questions. Let me clear my whiteboard in preparation. So let you be the groups of symmetry as in collateral triangle express permutations um, of the vertices numbered 1, 2, 3. Let H be the subgroup H equals 1, 2. Build the left and right coasts of H and G. So we have G is equal to S3. And we have H is equal to the set 1, 2. So geometrically, you can think of this as this subgroup as being the groups of a certain type of translation. Okay, the notation they use is 1. So first of all, let's build up our, uh, our right cosets. So 1, 3, 1, 3, h is equal to 1, is equal to, we apply, uh, we first have 1, 3, then we have 1 goes to, 1 goes to 2, 2, uh, 1 goes to, one goes to two, two goes to one, one goes to three. We have that. And we have H one three is equal to one three. And then we have one goes to three. Um, one goes to three, and then three goes to one. One goes to two. So already we can see with this that this group is not normal. We have two cosets that differ by that normality. Um, I mean, we could go through the rest of them. It'd just be a kind of slightly painful amount. Ah. Uh, so it's just a matter of one, two, one. So one, three, we have one, two, three. Yeah, so we're gonna have one, three, H, one, two, three of H, 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 one, two, three, and then one, three, two. Oh, we also have two, three, actually, yeah. So I'll just do these, I'll just do these two for the sake of almost completeness. So we have one, two, three. And then applying a permutation, we have one goes to two and two goes to three. So one goes to three. And then three goes to one, actually. So that means is two fixed in place. Yeah, two would then go to one and then one would go to two. So yeah, two is fixed in place. And H of one, two, three gives us, well, again, one, two, three, three, and then we have one goes to two, two goes to one, so we have one is fixed by this, and then two goes to three, and then three goes to one, one goes to two. So yeah, as you can see, violation, mainly important to see here is violation of normality all over the place is going to be the important thing to take from this. So that the reflection groups are not actually normal subgroups, at least when you're considering S sub 3. Alright. Alright, based on your answer to the previous question, is H normal in G? Uh, no. <laughs> we already had built several cosets that showed that it's not normal. Alright, the subgroup uh, 8Z is normal in Z. In the factor group, z over 8z, perform the computation 3 plus 8 over 7 plus 8. Actually, I'm going to quick look ahead. Um, 
All right, then I guess. You know what? Screw it. If they're not gonna prove, if they're not gonna prove it, then I will. So we're going to prove that z over n z is isomorphic to z mod n. So we let phi. We let phi of n z. be mapped to the equivalence class of n in z mod, z mod n. First, because we can express this as, we'll take the first positive root of this, so we have the cosets, we'll have the coset represented by 0, or we'll have the coset represented by 0 plus z plus nz 1 plus nz all the way to n minus 1 plus nz the show first of all that's this is well defined notice that like for example 0 plus n plus nz is or well a plus n plus nz is equal to a right a plus nz so we'll have that phi of a plus n plus nz is equal to the equivalence class of a plus n. Now notice that since a plus n is equivalent to a mod n, this equivalence class is just equal to a. So we can just take any of the members of the equivalence classes here as our definition. Now it should be obvious because we're going to be listing from zero to one uh, to n minus one that this function will be surjective and as well injective. So the main thing to show is that it preserves the group operation. So phi of a plus um, a plus d plus b plus z plus nz is equal to a plus b is equal to just how we have the addition, how we're defining the addition mod n, a plus b, well the equivalence class of this, but we don't worry about that, is equal to v of a plus nz plus v of b plus nz. which shows that we actually have an isomorphism. So that thing I told you, the hint, the sneaking feeling you might have had, uh, is actually true. That the integers like mod nz is equal to the integers modulo in the sense of quotient nz. So we can simply, knowing that, uh, perform the uh, computation 3 plus 8z equals 3 plus 7, uh, 3 plus 8z equals 7 plus 8z. So what we can in instead do is phi to the negative 1, phi of 8 plus, wait, what, what did we want, um, 3 plus 8z, 3 plus 8z, plus 7 plus 8z. So we then would then take phi to the negative 1 of the integer of uh, 3 plus 7 mod 8 mod 8 equals phi to the negative 1 of, in this case it would be 2 mod 8, 2 mod 8, which is equal to 2 plus 8z.
with two statements about a group G and a subgroup H that are equivalent to H is normal in G. So we have that G, H, G to the negative one is both a subset of H, and we also have that G, H, G to the negative one is equal to H. Both being statements that are equivalent to G, H equals H, G. Uh, in your own words, what is a factor group? A factor group, well, since it's doing my own words, a factor group is a subgroup of a group to where you can take a reasonable quotient that you can quotient out information that talks about how a subgroup relates to that larger group so that you can examine in more depth the group structure. Yeah, okay, and we are straight to the exercises. So before I do that, I'm gonna quick go on mute and I'm gonna quick grab some grab some wonder, one, uh, wonderful, wonderful coffee and water because my throat is killing me. So be right back. Well, that was a that was a very fun intermission. Um, turns out that turns out that my cat that my family has um, that we normally always keep inside decided to just go explore the woods for a few hours, and none of us realized that she was gone until she came back out the door, just like begging for attention, and we're like, "Why are you outside?" <laughs> oh, that was a good time. That was a good time. Anyways, anyways, back to the math. Back to the math. For each of the uh, 10.4 exercise, for each of the following groups G, determine whether H is a normal subgroup of G. If H is a normal subgroup of G, write out a Cayley table for the factor group G over H. So, G equals S4 and H equals A4. So let's think, let's think about this. So, a4. I mean, is a... Th First of all, let's just go up the list. Is a3... So, like, 
One, two, two, three, one, three. We take this and we multiply it by, oh gosh, I'm thinking, intuitively I'm thinking that it's going to be no, but I'm just wondering why. So we have one, so we'll have one, two, three, and we're going to multiply it by a three. No, okay. It is normal on A3, so it might just be something. So, one, two, two, three, one, four. This is going to be equal to one is sent to four, four is sent to one, one is sent to two, two is sent to three, three is sent to two, three is, okay. One, four, two, three. Um, and we multiply this by A4, which A4, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be the set one, one, two, one, one, two, one, three, one, four. Wait, let me double check. 4 factorial is 24. Oh, this group is going to have 12 elements. Writing this out is going to be a pain. So 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. 2, 3. 2, 4. 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 4. Then we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then we're going to have 1, 2. Three, four. One, three, two, four. One, four. Two, three. Now let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have two more that are going to be a mix. One, four, two, three. So we're going to have likely one, two. Oh, wait, no. These are. Oh, no. It's even worse than I thought. Because these are all even permutations. I know these are all odd permutations. So they're all going to be these horrible forms. Um, okay, let's think about it. Let's think about it. So, okay, let's think about it more conceptually. So suppose we have an element in A4, right? So we'll call this A1. So like, we have an element like sigma in A4, and suppose we multiply it by an element like tau in S3. And suppose we have um, tau sigma, or no, uh, tau sigma. Well, we know that. Oh, oh, that's actually a stupidly simple proof. Oh, that's actually not that bad. So then from here, tau to the negative one, well, we have two n, we have two k plus one, and we have again two k plus one. So this total cycle right here every cycle is going to be of the form 2k plus 1 2n or 2k plus 1 plus 2n 
plus 2k plus 1 is equal to 4k plus 2n plus 2 is going to be equal to 2 k 2k plus n plus 1 and as such this cycle is going to be in a sub 4 which as we saw earlier shows that um, the set tau a4 tau to the negative 1 is a subset of a sub 4 and this actually then this isn't just for a sub 4 this actually goes for any a sub n so a sub n we're going to have that the alternating group is always going to be normal Now let's think let's think even further to this because actually there's a, there's a really nice way to actually visualize all of this then so we know that a4 is equal to s4 or no we have that an is equal to sn over 2, right? So this is going to be equal to, we're going to have the order of the factor group be the index of an and sn, which by Lagrange's theorem is going to be equal to sn over an, which is equal to Sn over Sn, the order of Sn over 2 is going to be equal to 2. And the only group of order 2 is Z mod 2. So every factor group of Sn over An is going to be isomorphic to Z mod 2. So like every factor group will always capture parity. Oh, that is cool. That is a cool. Oh, that's awesome. I like that. I really like that. Okay. Uh, B, uh, G equals A5 and H equals 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2. Oh, God. Oh, that's horrible. Mm. All right, let's see. Hmm. This is kind of nasty. So, A5 has order, A5 has order three times four times five. AI has, or A5 has order three times four times five. And H has order, watch well, right order of A5. H has order three. So we have the order, if it is normal, of the factor group A5 over H is equal to four times five, which is equal to 20, which that's not a table I want to write out. So let's try for the sake of our sanities to prove that this is in fact not a normal subgroup. So we have one. Oh wait, actually. Oh, that's, yeah, it's easy. It's really easy. I'm pretty sure, yeah, okay, so. So let's take the permutation, like, one, oh wait, actually. Never mind, we, uh, yeah, it is true, but I, I don't even have to do any computations for this. So we know that A5 is simple, right? So it has no non-trivial normal subgroups, which means that since H is a proper, nor like a proper subgroup, it must be not normal. Otherwise it would contradict the long theorem of permutations. This bad boy right up here, theorem 10.10. .10. All right. Uh, G equals S sub four and H equals D sub four. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just click not.
Ooh, okay. G equals the quaternionic group. I need some more exercise with quaternionic stuff. So Q8 equals plus minus one zero zero one, which will we call this one plus minus one zero zero negative one equals j i think actually let me head back uh this is page 143 right let's go way back because it's like when we got to a lot of beginning of group stuff also my god we are already like near page 150 that's crazy to think it, it's barely been any time at all um this is going to the n-gon stuff. This is permutation groups. Um, all right, that's GL2R. And I assume if we're going to the cyclic groups, we're not going to be worrying about quaternionic groups because quaternionic groups are not cyclic. Um, list of subgroups of the quaternionic group. Um, that's the Heisenberg group. All right. GL2 subgroups. We have basic property. Yeah, here. So, yeah. Let's write this definition properly down. So, Q8 is equal to plus or minus. The first matrix is going to be 1, 0, 0, 1. 1, 0, 0, 1. Our second matrix is going to be plus minus 0, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Third is going to be plus minus 0, i, i, 0, 0, i, i, 0. And third is going to be plus or minus I zero negative I I zero zero negative I so we have that which we call the relations I squared J squared uh, set Q8 so we call I J zero is equal to I or well not not I is equal to one I J okay plus or minus plus or minus plus or minus so going back to page hopefully it doesn't break if I go to page 147 like so 147 oh that, that was a bit too far ahead okay so Oh gosh, how loud is that? Alright, it looks like it's fairly loud. Um, if you guys are wondering what that sound is, someone has the washer going in the house, so. Uh, Q, G equals Q, A, and H equals 1, I, negative 1, I, negative I, correct? Alright. So we have our subgroup H being equal to plus minus 1 plus minus I. So first of all, since we already have the plus and minuses, um, in here what we really only need to show is that we have the case for the positive matrices since we can just distribute one plus and minuses as need be so first of all our cosets are of course going to be this group has cardinality four this group has cardinality eight so if it is true, the cosets or the factor group is going to have cardinality 2. So first of all, let's calculate J H. This is going to be equal to, going to be equal to J, and then I J is going to be equal to, um, J is going to be equal to 0, I, I, 0 
times. Or ji is going to be equal to zero, one, zero, one, negative one, zero. It's going to be equal to negative i, zero, zero. Of course, a zero, zero. Doo -doo. Wait, let me double check that I'm doing it right. Oh wait, I'm being dumb. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So first, zero negative i, then i. Oh wow, I really am. I really have forgotten how to do basic matrix multiplication. Is equal to negative i. Zero. And then zero. I. That is correct, yeah. And then we can just have, we have plus and minus these. So we can just write this entire computation as this is equal to the matrix k, so plus or minus k. Plus minus k. That saves space, doesn't it? Shh. Oh gosh, I'm just going to put it over there. Oh gosh, how loud? It is definitely picking it up, oh gosh. Alright, so JH is going to be equal to that. HJ is going to be equal to, of course, the set plus minus J. And now we're going to be multiplying instead the set 0, 1, negative 1, 0, by 0, i, i, 0, is equal to burner. Wait, let me just double check this. So, JH, or, yeah, or JI in this case, was J times I. So, go, go to negative I, and then the negative I up there. It's going to be an I in the bottom right. So, this is going to be an I, zero. Zero, negative i. And because of the plus minus, this is going to be yes plus minus k. And then we're going to have to compute. Man, I really need to work with quaternions more often. Pull all this up here for space. We then compute k h is equal to plus or minus k. Wow, okay, the washer is getting really intense down there. Sounds like a whole goddamn beat. So k h, and then we have k i is equal to the matrix 0, 1, negative one zero multiplied by k is i zero i zero zero negative i is equal to zero one so it would be zero in the first place so it's going to be zero i it's going to be plus or minus that so it would be plus or minus j uh, excuse me Plus or minus j. And then hk is going to be equal to um, 
page k is going to be equal to brain think plus or minus k of course and then thinking about k times j just here computationally or k times i is going to be or i times k mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it will also be plus or minus, yeah. This by closure of the quaternions. So we do have that H is in fact a normal subgroup. So let's perform the factor groups. Well, actually, the thing is, QA consists of eight elements. H consists of four elements. So Q8 over H is just two elements, which just means that it's going to be the integers mod two. Nice. Very simple and clean. I like it. So, and this is just going to be like the integers mod 5. I already showed that with the isomorphism. Find all subgroups of D4. Nah. Um, find all the subgroups of the quaternionic group Q8, which subgroups are normal. So, uh, what are all the factor groups of Q8 up to isomorphism? Uh, excuse me. Uh, to be sort of on up matrix of format. The group that you use abelian. You use normal one too. This is not equal to you. System matrices of form is abelian. Um, I mean, I should do this. I should just practice because there's going to be some matrix stuff soon. I don't know if it's next chapter, but so we have the set of all a, b, zero, c with a, c not equal to zero. And first we need to show that the group consisting of one, zero, x, zero. Uh, one zero, actually not one zero zero one x is a subgroup. So we're going to call this group T for upper triangular. I'm just going to call this group U. So we're going to have, first of all, it has identity zero because it gives us the identity matrix. So we have identity. Um, we'll be able to see from this how we get inverses. So one zero one x zero one times one y zero one is equal to 1 times 0 and then we have 1 or no not that we have y plus x correct yeah y plus x and then we have 0 and we once again have 1 so our inverses are our normal negative um, negative numbers. So the inverse of 1x01 is 1 negative x01. And the operation is obviously closed, so we have a group. Um, from here, prove that u is abelian. Well, we just showed that, like, because we're working with entries in R, and R is an abelian group, it's going to be abelian, because y plus x is equal to x plus y. Um, x plus y. Um, prove that u is normal in T. So for this, suppose we have some matrix A, B, 0, C. Well, first of all, actually, we'll use the previous condition. Um, so A, B, uh, 0, C. Let's find the inverse of A, B, uh, 0, C. So A, B, 0, C. D, We'll call it a prime, b prime, zero, c prime is equal to, oh yeah, this is just normal linear algebraic inverse, but I'm going to just like actually prove it in this specific case I'm thinking. So we have a, a prime, uh, a, a prime, it's just that for its upper left entry. It's 
root zero. And for this entry, we're going to have a b prime plus b c prime. And we're going to have, oh, this is like the Heisenberg group all over again. Ew. Shh. So then we're going to have c c prime here. So we're going to have that keeping this in mind. Like, let's, sh let's shrink it hilariously down over here and bring that here. We're going to have that a prime is equal to a to the negative one and c prime is equal to c to the negative one. We know that um, these inverses exist because otherwise they would be zero, which is not allowed. And knowing this, we have a b prime plus b c to the negative one. So we take this, we move it to the other side, and we get b prime is going to be equal to b negative b c to the negative one over a. So let's keep these notes over here. So what we need to show is that multiplying on the left and right by any matrix um, and its inverse gives us another element in this. So we're going to have a, b, zero, c, one, x, zero, one, a to the negative 1, negative b, c to the negative 1, over a, 0, c to the negative 1. So now we need to show that this is a matrix of a, form, of a nice form, so let's get some disgusting computations out of the way. So we're going to have this matrix is going to be we are going to have a, b, 0, c, uh, a and negative 1, a and negative 1, 0, and also it should be clear this is c to the negative 1 here. So the only complicated thing we have is this matrix, so it's negative b, c, to the negative one over a plus x c to the negative one. From here, we have a matrix of the form. Oh yeah, one zero. We don't even need to finish computing it because uh, all we know is that these top left and top right terms are going to evaluate to one and one respectively. Or top left and bottom right terms are evaluated to 1, 1 respectively. Bottom left term is going to evaluate to 0. And that means that we're going to have a matrix of our form. So by the um, previous theorem, this means that this subgroup is going to be normal in T. Alright. Uh, show that T over U is abelian. Show that t over u is billion. So let's think about this in a more general sense. So like I want to figure out when any factor group is abelian. So suppose that a h b h is equal to b h a h which implies that a b h is equal to b a h now if this is true then for any a b h there exists an h prime 
such that there's a ba h to the negative one. But you could do something kind of complicated, and you can make something that we call the commutator, uh, which is to show that h is equal to b to the negative 1, a to the negative 1, b, a, h to the negative 1. Which shows that if this holds, then this means that your f group is abelian. Or your um, factor group is abelian. Or no, not h to the negative one. Well, I was being dumb. I was being silly. Give me a second. H prime. Um. And I mean, we could explicitly compute this. I mean, we already have a lot of the matrix formulas previously de um, derived. That means that we technically have the means to compute this commutator. It would just be kind of messy. I guess let's just do it. Because I mean, we're going to have to compute that commutator anyway. Actually, wait, no. Let me think more carefully. Because of factor group U, I'm wondering if we're going to have to use the fact that U is a billion here. So if a subgroup, if a subgroup is normal, if um, an abelian subgroup is normal, it's that factor group abelian. Hmm. Let's think. First, we have this description in terms of that. Then we have that AB. Let's note that AB. Mmm. Mmm, spicy. Okay. ABH. H. A B H H equals B A H prime H. So we have that A B knowing this identity earlier. A B B to the negative one, A to the negative one, B A H equals B A h prime h equals b a h is equal to b a h prime h which shows that b h b a is equal to b a is equal to b a h prime or some h prime. So, mm, okay, okay, wait. So if we have a, b, h, you know our group is a billion. Mm. B A 
is equal to bih prime. If our group is a billion, because we're able to swap around indices here. No, no, because that only worked for the identity. So we do have to do the disgusting commutator operation. Although in this it should be... It's going to be fairly easy to see. Because we're going to have a matrix of the form 1, 0, 1, um, x times a, 0, b, we'll call that y. Then we're going to have a prime, y prime, 0, b prime. Then we're going to have a to the negative 1, is it? Yeah, then we're going to have a to the negative 1, 0, b to the negative 1, y to the negative 1. For now, y is just a term, right? Just know that y exists, because we're going to show that it doesn't actually matter what it specifically is. So b prime to the negative 1 a prime to the negative 1, a prime to the negative 1, y to the negative 1, 0. This whole thing is just going to end up being a matrix of the form 1, 0, x1 times b prime to the negative 1, b to the negative 1, b, b prime, a to the negative 1, a, um, a prime to the negative one, a, a prime, and then some just monstrous term y up there, right? But when the dust settles, well, we're going to have a matrix of the form 1, 0, 1, 0, some monstrous term y. I, I'm going to know here that this term is not going to be pretty. 0, uh, no, not 0. 1, 1x, 0, 1. But notice that this term is in our subgroup, right? This term is definitionally in our subgroup already. So these terms are going to combine to give us another term in U. So by this condition right here, this shows that we actually have a abelian subgroup. All right, clear the board there. Let me keep my eyes on time because I do have something later today. Uh, it's only ten sixteen. We're fine. We're fine. Show that the intersection of two normal subgroups is a normal subgroup. Okay. So suppose suppose that G H equals H G and gk equals kg. Now suppose that we have g h cap cap. Which means that we can express it as g equals of either g of h equals g of k. Now note there'll be an element h prime such that g of h is equal to g h prime g and there'll be some element k prime such that k prime is equal to k prime of g. However, in this case, we just subtract out the g's because we already know there's a quality. This is, by the way, this is like normalness when it comes to that. 
and then up here is where we get this and down here is where we get this which that implies that we have we cancel on the right side by g h prime is equal to k prime which then implies that gh is equal to hg or h prime g with h prime in h cap cap This is actually something I didn't know before, but that was a fairly simple but fairly elegant proof. All right, um, delete. All right, if G is abelian, prove that G over H must also be abelian. Um, that just comes down to the fact that that commutator earlier, A, B to the negative one, um, A, B. is equal to the identity, which is in our subgroup. Because the identity is always in the subgroup. So that argument previously, like, we don't even need to do any work besides that. It's just important to note that it was abelian in that case. Actually, wait. Oh, I probably could have just... I probably could have just showed that... Is T an abelian? Is T an abelian? I'm pretty sure T is an abelian group. So I could have just shown that, and said I spent way too much time. <laughs> uh. Actually, it might not be an abelian group. I oh, actually, yeah, it's not, it's not, my bad, my bad. If H is a normal subgroup of G, such that H and G over H are abelian, then G is abelian. I think the example we're supposed to use here is this. Because let's quick confirm, let's double check. A, B, 0, C. And then B, and then D, E, E, 0, F. Is equal to A, D, 0, C, F. And then we here um, have here A, E, plus B, F. So plugging this in, we get that um, C so we know what U is appealing so we can't do that. Let me think of a good connection. Okay, if it's equal to this, then note that D E 0f times ab 0c is equal to, again, we have ad 0cf, but over here we have db 0c. So we have these two expressions. Where do we find the contradiction? So for example, let's then take one zero two x and two zero three y. Actually, wait, no, no, we don't need to worry about that. We can just like interchange the twos and the ones. One y. This is going to be equal to two, zero, two. Um, two plus, or no. 2y plus, no, 
Just what am I thinking? I'm being I'm, I'm being daft. I'm being daft. It's going to be equal to y plus x. But if we interchange it, we get 2 y 0 2 or 2 y 0 1 times 1 x 0 2 is going to be equal to again 2 and 2 on the diagonal. It's there on the bottom left. But instead here, we have 2x plus 2y. Let's call this result i1. Let's call this result i2. i1 minus i2 is equal to the matrix or in this case we should actually do it the reverse order also let me just quick do this because otherwise this will bug me to no end um there we go okay let's see what the i1 is equal to i2 i2 minus i1 is going to be equal to zero zero zero, zero x plus y So if x and y are any pair of uh, any pair of real numbers that are not equal to zero, this difference is going to be non-zero, which means that these are not the same matrices, which means that it, um, they do not commute. However, we saw that both its factor group and its like a subgroup of it is abelian. So we have a counterexample that if h is a normal subgroup such uh, of g such that h and g over h are abelian, the g is abelian. If G is cyclic, then we prove G over H will see cyclic. It's actually an interesting proof. So, alright, if G is cyclic, G is cyclic, actually, I mean, could we do a complete characterization? of those types of groups now. So if G is cyclic, there's some element G equals an element of A. Then any subgroup of a cyclic group is cyclic. Right? Yes, yeah, subgroup of a cyclic group is cyclic. So this means that h is equal to the order b for b not equal to a. So then, oh yeah, then just the coset of a plus the coset of B, this coset, <laughs> oh, I hate this notation, is equal to B. Actually, we don't even need the fact that this group is cyclic. We could have just called this H. And just replace all the Bs by Hs. Because A generates everything like that. Uh, okay. Uh, if G is cyclic, then G over H is cyclic. Prove or disproof. If H and G over H are cyclic, then G is cyclic. So suppose. H is equal to the cyclic group generated by B. And g is equal to and a cyclic group of a h is equal to g is equal to g over h
Oh, wait, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the counter example. I think it'd be like A3 and S3, right? Because A3 can be shown to be cyclic. Yeah, A3 is cyclic. The factor group is cyclic, but S3 is not cyclic. So this is false. All right, let H be a subgroup of index two of a group G. Prove that H must be a normal subgroup of G. Right, this is the fact, this comes down to the fact that A N is a normal subgroup of S N for N greater than or equal to three. And A N has index two. Oh yeah, A N has index two. So let H be a subgroup of index two of a group G. Prove that H must be a normal subgroup of G. Uh, this comes down to the fact that if you have if you have gh is not equal to hg right then we have the cosets h gh and hg which already imply that the index of h and g is greater than 2 a contradiction so then if that's the case then at least one of these must be then either gh is equal to h or hg is equal to g. But then g is an h, either way you split it. Or hg is, yeah, gh is equal to h. But then g is an h, a contradiction, if we assume g a priori to not be an h. So just by the amount of cosets, um, G must be normal, or H must be normal in G. And since the index of S3, or, yeah, Sn, An, for uh, equals 2, equals 2, for N greater than or equal to 3, Um, we have that a n is normal. All right, uh, if she has. All right, let h be a subgroup of index two. Let h just be a normal subgroup. Okay. Let me double check my time. Are we doing all right in terms of time? Yes, we are. Okay. If a group G has exactly one subgroup H of order K, prove that H is normal in G. Hmm. That one's a bit tougher, actually. Subgroup H is or K. Prove that G is normal. Alright, so suppose H is equal to the order of H is equal to K. And if K is a subgroup of G such that order of K is equal to K, K is equal to H. We want to prove that GH is equal to G. 
So suppose that GH is not equal to HG, which means that there exists an H such that GH is not equal to H prime of G for any H prime in G. Or in other words, g h g to the negative one is not equal to h prime. Now, oh, okay, this might be sneaky. Now, define a group g h g to the negative one. This group is going to have index k. This group is going to have index k. And this is also going to be a group. It should be easy to see that both identities and inverses exist in this group. Um, this is the form, this is all elements of the form g h to the negative 1 for h and h. However, because g h g to the negative 1 is equal to k, we know that g h g to the negative 1 is equal to h because of this supposition up here, which from previous theorem is the same as saying that gh is equal to hg, which means that h is normal. All that is cool. That is a very cool proof. All right, define the centralizer of an element g in uh, group g to be the set cg is equal to x in g, such that xg is equal to gh. All right, show that cg is a subgroup of g. If G generates a normal subgroup of G, uh, prove that CG is normal in G. So we define the centralizer to be C of G is equal to the set of all X, such that XG is equal to GX. So first of all, the I E is in this. Um, if x to the negative, if x g is equal to g x, then we have that g x to the negative 1 is equal to x to the negative 1 g. So x is in c of g implies that x to the negative 1 is in c of g. And to finally show that it's closed under composition, we show simply that so x y of g is equal to x g y is equal to x uh, is equal to g g of x y. So we have products r in um, c of g, which means that c of g is a subgroup. All right, from here. If G generates a normal subgroup of G, so suppose that the cyclic group of G is normal. Normal. So that, so that H order of G is equal to order of G of H for all H and G. We need to show, so suppose we have h of c of g, h of c of g, which is the same as, suppose we have some element h g prime, g prime and g, prime and c of g. Which means that if we multiply this on the right by g, So we multiply this on the right by g to get h g prime g. We can swap these out to get h of g g prime. Because this is normal, we know that there is some. We know that there is some g to the n, g to the n. 
such that this is equal to um, g to the n h prime g prime then multiplying this on the right by g gives us g to the n h prime g prime g is equal to what now So wait, okay. Let, let's think about this. Let's think about this. So we have H G prime G is equal to H G G prime equals G to the N H prime G prime. So then multiplying on the left side by the inverse of g to the n gets us that g to the n g to the negative n h g prime of g is equal to h prime of g prime And then we multiply on the right side. Nah, mm. Wait, this is messing me up. This problem's messing me up. So let's move this up a little bit. Wait, I think there's a better way to do this. I'm kind of like skipping a step that's making this weird. And I think I know what it is. So suppose we have h g prime. This is going to be equal to h g prime, g prime, g times g to the negative one. It's going to be equal to h g g prime, g to the negative one. is going to be equal to g to the n h g prime g to the negative one So also, we know that by because it's a subgroup, negative one, two prime. Hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, I'm kind of lost at this point. Let's think, let's think harder. Let's think harder about this. Alright, HG. Well, it's HG, G to the negative 1. We use the fact that G prime is in the centralizer of G to get HG, G prime, G to the negative 1. We then use the fact that the cyclic group is normal to get HG is equal to G to the n, H. Um, G prime, G to the negative 1. What do we do from here? I'm just trying to kind of find the step where ah oh, gosh I'm trying to find the step where we can like swap around the H and G prime Well, okay. What if we go back here? I'm thinking. Is the group G normal in... Oh, obviously, wait. Wait, the subgroup, the cyclic group, is normal normal in CG, because it's normal in the group over it, and G's in that. Which means that, by normality, going about this wrong. So, if it's normal in G, and that means for CG, G, G, G to the negative 1, is in C of G. Oh, actually, that's not really that useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we assuming anything about the finiteness of this group? If G generates a normal subgroup of G, prove that CG is normal in G. Hmm. I feel like this is I feel like this has something to do with it, but I don't have that yet. Let's think about a separate condition. So let's think H G H to the negative one. H G H to the negative one. So we multiply that by H G H to the negative one G G to the negative one. We use the fact that it's cyclic to get HG, HG, HG prime, G to the N, H to the negative 1, G to the negative 1. Say H to the N. 
g prime h negative one g negative one we're able to move the g to the n prime h g prime h to the negative one g to the negative one They multiply on the right by h. Notice that these are string of equalities. So we get that hg is equal to all this stuff. Let's just call this stuff y. y equal to yg to the negative 1 h. Which gets us that hg equals y h g to the, so let's call it k and now we have that both of these h's cancel out so we're moving a lot of this extra work gets us that h g is equal to our h g prime is equal to g n prime h g prime g to the negative one but we can do another trick to move h to the negative one here then over here then annihilate it to ultimately get that g prime is equal to some g to the let's call it l g prime g to the k um, and if we need if we show that this is true then it works So we move E over there. Oh yeah, obviously this is true because this will be in the commutator. Uh, so we get that G prime squared is equal to GL G to the K, which work, uh, all that worked out, yeah. That is nice. Okay. All right. Recall that the center of group G is a set G uh, Z G, such that X G is equal to G X for all G and G. Uh, calculate the center of S three. Back at the Nash. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's gonna fundamentally come back, uh, come down to that, that commutivity of the center. So that's actually like fairly easy to show the normal. Um, if G over uh, ZG is cyclic, show that G is abelian. Nah. <laughs> actually, yeah, we'll show that. First of all, we'll show that. So suppose that we have a ZG, right? So we're going to have or z g because our whole group, not the integer z, regular g, no, z, z g. Then it will be we'll have a x, but that will be equal to x a because of how we're literally defining the center to be. Uh, so is it's going to be z g of a. These are just going to trivially be equal, and it's really easy to show. Um. If G over ZG is cyclic, so suppose that G, there exists an element A, such that, oh gosh, let me get rid of all this, ich, the workings out. So, suppose um, A plus Z, G is equal to G over ZG. So suppose that we have B C uh, right hmm. 
Oh, it's actually a really weird proof it looks like it's gonna be. So if, okay, so what this is equivalent to saying is that if G over ZG is cyclic, then ZG is going to be our entire group. So, hmm. so if G over ZG is cyclic, then we need to show that ZG is equal to G. So suppose that we have some multiplication BC. This is going to be equal to BE um, BE CE, which is going to be equal to A E C E. It's going to be hmm. So wait, okay. So let me think. Let me think. So this means for any element B. For any element, okay. Well, this is the same as saying is that for any element B, the quotient group of ZG that contains B, or the quotient group of, yeah, the quotient group of B that contains um, B plus ZG is going to be equal to the quotient group that contains A to the N, um, is going to be equal to A to the N plus ZG for some N. Right, so there's some element such that a n times c over c and z g is going to be equal to uh, b. And similarly, for any element d, we're going to have a a to the k times d is equal to c. So we're going to have that BC is equal to A to the N, C, A to the K, D, is going to be equal to, because C and D are in the centralizer, um, we can swap them around. We can swap around first A to the N, A to the K, C, D is equal to a to the n. Oh yeah. Yeah, the full way you want to do this is then, let me write out the full derivation here. Um, let me also move all this stuff to the left -er side. It's going to be a n, a k, c d, equals a to the n plus k. CD. So now, uh, A to the N plus K, DC, equals A to the K, A to the N, DC, is equal to A to the KD, A to the NC, is equal to CB. Oh yeah, actually, uh, I was supposed to use. I was supposed to use. Uh, let me use a better notation for this. So for this, replace C with um. E, or actually F. So we have that BF is equal to FB. And it comes down to commutivity of multiplying this and the fact that we're working in the center. 
So if the center is cyclic, then our group is abelian. Or if the factor group pushing out by the center is cyclic, then our group is abelian. And now I'm wondering if the same would actually apply the other way around. But we'll see, well, we'll see. So 14. Oh, our last question, and we've only been streaming for two hours. Not bad for the fact that we've worked through a decent amount of the questions. Not all of them, but a decent amount. Uh, let G be a group, and G prime equals um, the cyclic group generated by A, B, A to the negative 1, B to the negative 1. That is, G prime is a subgroup of all finite products of elements in G of the form A, B, A to the negative 1, B to the negative 1. This subgroup, G prime, is called the commutator subgroup of G. So first, show that G prime is a normal subgroup of G. Um, so it's going to be G is a subgroup of all finite products of elements of G. Form A, B, A to negative 1. So we're going to have, suppose we have C, A, B, A to the negative 1, B to the negative 1, all to the power of n. Well, proving this group is going to be normal is actually kind of painful. Also, I'm wondering... Wait, when it's saying that, I'm going to go quick go... Don't mind me going on Wikipedia um, to search. I'm wondering what they specifically mean here. I don't know if they mean we fix the elements A and B. Or if they mean we choose any elements A and B. So, commutator subgroup. Because I know this is one of the things where I was like, when I got to the end of the text, I was like, I, yeah, I should have wor uh, worked more with this. So a commutator subgroup. Uh, the subgroup generated by all the commutators. Okay. So it's not just a fixed A and B. It is a set of all A and B and the products of all those forms. Which means most likely this is going to be something by induction. Um, for elements G and H, uh, G, the commutator of G and H, um, the commutators, general G H equals H G G of H, however the notation is arbitrary and they're not equal to the, so it is generated by all the commutators. All right. So first of all, Let's see. So suppose we have C of, first of all, let's just do the case. We're gonna be doing induction on the n number of times we multiply this. So for n equals one, we're going to have C of A, B, A to the negative one, B to the negative one. And we want to show that there's some element h, such that h is equal to c that. Oh, yeah. Okay, actually, I was being, I'm being kind of daft. So we want to show that there's some hc um, with h a commutator. So we want to show that there's some commutator or some c to negative 1, a, b, a to negative 1, b to negative 1. We want to show that is in... Uh, or C, that we want to show that this whole thing, C to the negative one, we want to show this is in the commutator. So we'll just call this the COMM. Do we have a special name? Oh, it's just called G prime. Okay. So we want to show this is in G prime. So we have that. C A, um, so we have I mean C A B Let me think. So C A B to the negative one is going to be equal to C to the negative one. Actually wait. 
Let's think about this. So C and B, A and negative one, B and negative one, uh, C and negative one. So we just take so. Hmm. I mean, first of all, what I'm wondering, so we don't have to use induction on any of this, is the commutate is the product of commutators a commutator? Let's check. So a to negative one, b to negative one, a b, x to the negative one, y to the negative one, x y. So suppose this was equal to um, I don't know, fucking pi to the negative one, gamma to the negative one, pi gamma. I mean, in this case, well, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight symbols. So each of these pi, gamma, pi, and gamma are going to correspond to two symbols, respectively, unless we just have, yes, going to correspond to two symbols, respectively. However, if that were the case, so yeah, the product of commutators sadly doesn't look like it's a, actually, no. Yeah, yeah, the product of commutators is not a commutator, which is why we need to have a subgroup generated by commutators. So, C, A, B. We'll call, we'll just do this. C, A, B, A, B to negative one, C. Actually, now nah, let's do it in the form they want us to do in. C, negative one, B, negative one. A, B, C to negative one. Or actually, wait, how do they write this? Oh, gosh, I'm being dumb. Okay. A, B, A negative one. B negative one. C to negative one. So can we write this out as some X, Y, X to negative one, Y to negative one? So for this, we would let, we have four symbols total here, and we have six symbols on top. So we're gonna have some redundancy. Um, X is going to have to, we know that X is going to have to begin with, X begins with one, begins with C, with C, and we know that Y begins with C as well. And this is because whatever um, c dot 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 inverse is going to be equal to dot 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 c to negative one. So we know that x begins with c and y begins with c. So in that case, could we let x be of the form c dot 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 c to negative one and then y starts c dot 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 c to the negative one perhaps as well? I'm thinking. It's like suppose we have c a b x is equal to c a b and y is equal to c to the negative one c is equal to c to, oh wait what if we just have y just equal to c to the negative one and then we have x y x to the negative one y to the negative one oh yeah actually wait let me fix that we would have to actually swap that around so we have 
uh, see your negative one. And then y is equal to c. All right, so we have then x, y, x to negative one, y to negative one equals c, a, b, c to the negative one, c, and then reverse it around. C, B to negative 1, A to negative 1, C. Hmm. No, it needs to be a bit more structured than that. thing is I don't see us writing I don't see us writing this possibly as the product of commutators so let's think also let me give, give you guys a bit less white space and just focus on that Also, by the way, we're trying to show normality of this. It's kind of obvious that the commutator subgroup is a subgroup. Because, first of all, it's generated by stuff, so like closure is already a, like a priori supposed. And then it's very easy to form inverses, but besides that, besides that. Because um, every element is its own inverse under this structure. <laughs> so that's actually really cool. Um, or the Give me a second, actually. This is a difficult question. Oh, but the problem is, it's the last question in the section. I don't want to just, like, walk out on it. Although I only have, like, less than 50 minutes to actually get this done. Because I am going to a marching band event later today. Fundraiser event. Um, X, Y, X, thing of one, one, and one. Okay. So we want a commutator, or a product of commutators, that is equal to this. So, first of all, we need to consider whether or not it's possible for us to have one commutator that does it, or if we're going to need to use the product of commutators. So in this case, let's think about what we would need for a commutator. So x is going to have to, of course, start with c. And it's going to have to end with a c to the negative 1, and y is going to have to begin with a c, and it's going to have to end with, I wonder if it's going to have to end with another c. That's what I'm wondering. What if instead we don't focus on making that super long and we make x equal c a and then y is equal to b c. Oh yeah, why won't begin with a c? Why will end with a c? Oh wait, will it? 
Um, no, actually, I think it will be going to C. Shoot. Okay. What if x y x is equal to C A, and we have y equals y equals C A C, x equals C A C, and y equals C to the negative one. A C negative one. Or C A yeah C A C. Let's see if that works. So we get C. A, C, C to the negative 1, this should be a B, B, C, and then we're going to begin the next one with C to the negative 1, C to the negative 1, A to the negative 1, negative one and then we have C A B A negative one hmm oh that is tough okay I'm not thinking it's possible, but I don't know how to prove it's not possible. So in that case, it would have to be the product of commutators. So like, suppose we had a commutator CA, C to negative 1, A to negative 1. Then we have A, B, A to negative one, B to negative one. So we'd cancel out these A's, but we'd stuck at the C. Mm. Ah. Okay. So we're going to have to have a product of commutators, most likely. So we have C A. Now, do we want C A B? C uh. Hmm. Ah, I don't know. I do not know. Oh gosh. Okay. Let me take my mind off this also so I can answer a text I just got. For a second. Okay, let's see if you could mm, okay, that's your prime's final product. I'll see in the form A B A Nangle B. The G prime is the commutator subgroup of G. Show that G prime is the normal subgroup of G. A normal subgroup G. So we need to show that if we have an element in C, we have A B, A to negative one, B to negative one. C negative one. This can be written as a product of elements in the commutators. So, mm. wait a minute. Oh, wait, no, no. Yeah, a lot of the weirdness of this, I think it comes down to the swapping, like we have A, B, C, but we have A, B, C, we have A, we have C, A, B, and then A, B, C. There's not like a really weird, uh, uh, consistent order. So 
So what if we have, all right, we have C, A, we have B, A, B negative one, A negative one. So we take the group. Ah, oh, no. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm missing something really obvious here. I'm wondering. We don't necessarily have the subgroup of a normal group is normal. Mm. Let's just start crunching away at stuff. So, we have C A, C to the negative one, A to the negative one, or no, in this case actually, it would be, let's first note that if we multiply this on the left by A C, A to the negative one, C to the negative one, C A, B, A to the negative one, B to the negative one, C to the negative one, this is going to be equal to A, C, we cancel out these, B, A to the negative one, B to the negative one, C to the negative one. Wait. So let's, okay, let's actually keep an important note of this. So let, first of all, let's call H1 is equal to A, C, A to the negative one, C to the negative one. Then we get that multiplication of H1. We're basically going to be constructing an inverse for this. So C A B A to the negative one, B to the negative one, C to the negative one is equal to A C. Uh, we cancel out A to the negative one, C to the negative one, um, and with C and A to get B a to the negative one, b to the negative one, c to the negative one. So what do I do from here? So now what if I multiply this right side? Let's make a, an element H2, which is going to be equal to C, B, A. Or C, B, A. Wait, I'm wondering. This is just going to be some playing around. So CBA, C to the negative one, A to the negative one, B to the negative one. Then we multiply it by that. Oh, 
Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So after we apply that, I'll feel like a genius. Okay. Oh man, ah, I'm hyped, I'm hyped, I'm hyped. So we have that let x equal a, y equal cb. Then we have x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1 is equal to a, c, b, a, c, b. Well, let me think. A, C, B, A to the negative one. And then because we swap the order of these, B to the negative one, C to the negative one. So if we have X, Y, if we call X, Y, X to the negative one, Y to the negative one, we call that H2. We get that this is equal to this term up here is equal to or h1 times this right here is equal to h2 in the commutator subgroup in g prime which simply means that this is equal to h1 negative 1 h2 which implies that this term right here is actually in the commutator uh, subgroup and just doing a simple induction on the number of elements in the um, generated, we can just simply apply a bunch of inverses to always reduce it down to this case, which shows that the commutator subgroup is normal. All oh, that is satisfying. That is satisfying. Okay. Ah, my gosh. Okay. This is why you stick it out with these problems, because then you'll just have random insights. Sometimes you just gotta play around with numbers. So, let B be a normal subgroup of G. Prove that g over n is abelian if and only if n contains the commutator subgroup of g. So first of all, we're going to be doing, all right, first of all, g over n abelian implies that g prime is a subset, or is, we should say a subgroup, but in this case I'm just going to do subgroup, a uh, subset of n. So suppose in this case that a plus n, actually no, this, this is going to be some ring theoretic notation. So a n, b n, or yeah, I should just say a b n is equal to b a n. Right, this is going to be our assumption. So now suppose we have elements x and y, and we have the expression x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1. Hmm. Let me think of how we go about this, because this is kind of subtle. By the looks of it. So x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1. So this implies that... How do we show this an element of n? Well, this is the same as showing that x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1, of n is equal to n, right? But notice that this is the same. Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. Wait a minute, I might not got it. Or I might, I might. This is the same as x, y. <laughs> oh god, okay. This is the same as x, y, n x to the negative 1, n, 
y to the negative 1 n is equal to n. Notice here that instead of our usual two terms, we have three terms in this. Now, using this abelianness property, we have that x to the negative 1 n, x y n, y to the negative 1 n is equal to n. Actually, no. That's a, this is what we want to show. This is what we want to show. So we should instead just write um, x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1, n equals um, this uh, multiplied by this, which means we can separate these. And then we get y, n, y to the negative 1, n, which is equal to simply n, which is what we wanted to show. Um, and what this is the same as saying is that x, y, x to the negative 1, uh, y to the negative 1, n is equal to n, which is literally just the same as saying x, y, x to the negative 1, y to the negative 1 is an n. And since it's the case for any x and y, we have that the commutator is inside of the subgroup. That is, uh, this is already a really satisfying result. So let's show it the other one. So suppose that we have a, b of n. Um, since n is in the subgroup, we can, we note that a, b, n is equal to b to the negative one a to the negative 1, b a of n, which just collapsing terms, or a b n uh, times a b n is equal to is equal to b a n. That is a very satisfying result to end on, because I've always known that was true, I've always heard about this, but I've never done the proof myself. And especially this initial direction, the um, n it contains the commutator subgroup if g over n is abelian, I've never done that on my own before. That was extremely satisfying. Yeah, this whole section was extremely satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll keep it short and brief as an ending. That's it. Next we're going to be going on to homomorphisms. And very specifically, the isomorphism theorems, which are very powerful and we're going to be using for the rest of this book. And then matrix groups and symmetry, which does slightly scare me, but we, we should hopefully be good. Shh. Anyways, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Go on to this for preview. And then just write my normal thanks for tuning in. Have a nice day.